sure that we're recording. Um, week eight, congrats, first of all, on making it halfway through the semester. It's a big deal. Uh, this morning, it kind of hit me. I'm like, wow, we're in November. Thanksgiving's in a few weeks. Do you want to like go visit family over Thanksgiving? And we were like talking about if we we're going to go visit family. And then we started talking about Christmas. And I realized that it like made me not very excited to come to work today. And so, <laughs> so I, I got to stop thinking ahead. got to enjoy this beautiful weather we're having. Enjoy where we're at. And uh, but it's, it's crazy. It's crazy how fast it's going. Uh, so today I had a couple things. I have another good joke. Uh, not dad jokes today. I have, I have another story joke today. Uh, I have a spiritual thought, not in that order. And then we'll go ahead and talk about air handling today. So uh, let's see here. Uh, Jason, would you be up for saying our opening prayer after our spiritual thought? Thanks. Okay. Let's see if I can find my joke. All right. <clears throat> a big city lawyer went duck hunting in rural Tennessee. He shot and dropped a bird, but it fell into a farmer's field on the other side of the fence. As the lawyer climbed over the fence, an elderly farmer drove up on his tractor and asked him what he was doing. The litigator responded, I shot a duck and it fell in this field, and now I'm going to retrieve it. The old farmer replied, this is my property and you're not coming over here. The indignant lawyer said, I'm one of the best trial attorneys in the United States, and if you don't let me get that duck, I'll sue you and take everything you own. The old farmer smiled and said, apparently you don't know how we settle disputes in Tennessee. We settle small disagreements like this with the three kick rule. The lawyer asked, what's the three kick rule? The farmer replied, well, because the dispute occurred on my land, first I kick you three times and then you kick me three times and so on back and forth until someone gives up. The attorney quickly thought about the, about the proposed contest and decided that he could easily take on the old geezer. He agreed to abide by the local custom. The old farmer slowly climbed down from the tractor and walked up to the attorney. He first, uh, his first kick planted the toe of his heavy steel toed work boot into the lawyer's groin and dropped into his knees. The second one hit his midriff and the last one, uh, the third kick to his rear end sent him face first into a, fresh cow, into a fresh cow pie. The lawyer summoned every bit of his will and managed to get to his feet. Wiping his face with the arm of his jacket, he said, all right, now it's my turn. The old farmer simply smiled and said, nah, I give up. You can have the duck. All right. Okay, for our spiritual thought today, um, from our recent general conference, Elder Ulysses Sawadi said this. My dear friends, when we resist the little temptations, which often come unexpectedly in our life, we are better equipped to avoid serious transgressions. As President Spencer W. Kimball said, Seldom does one enter into deeper transgression without first yielding to lesser ones, which open the door to the greater. A clean field does not suddenly become weedy. While preparing to accomplish his divine mission on earth, the Savior Jesus Christ exemplified the importance of constantly resisting everything that might dissuade us from, re from realizing our eternal, potential, our eternal purpose. After several unsuccessful attacks by the enemy who attempted to divert him from his mission, the Savior categorically dismissed the devil by saying, Get thee hence, Satan. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Later in his talk, he said, I know that by following Jesus' Jesus' example, we will avoid many tragedies and undesirable behaviors that might cause family problems and disagreements, negative emotions and inclinations, perpetuating perpetuating injustices and abuses, enslavement by evil addictions, and anything else that would be against the Lord's commandments. I invite all of us to hear him in every thought and follow him with all our heart in order to obtain the strength and courage to say no and get thee hence. I promise that the Lord will send an added measure of his, of his Holy Spirit to strengthen and comfort us as we, and we may become individuals after the Lord's own heart. I was talking with my wife this weekend about a family member who has kind of chosen a different path. And um, we just talked about the importance of the little things, the little decisions that we make every day, uh, both about temptation and just about everything, you know, and it kind of reminded me of President Ubdorf's talk when he talked about one single degree. If you're one single degree off and you fly around the globe on the equator, one single degree off, you'll end up hundreds of miles away from the equator at the end of it. And um, and, and it holds true with, with all of this. It holds true with temptation. And so I would just invite all of us um, to continually kind of evaluate our lives to see where we're at 
how we're feeling with things, what we're choosing to do with our free time, what our, our, our default inclinations are. Um, because if, if we're constantly evaluating ourselves and seeing where we're at, then we'll never get too far off course before, before we, we catch our mistakes. Um, but if we never think about it and we just keep on getting further and further off the course, then, then we'll end up making really big mistakes in the future. So, all right, uh, let's see. Jason, you up for saying our prayer? Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be able to meet here as a class and to be able to learn more about functions and programming. Father, please help us with thy spirit today that we might be able to understand what is taught to us and that we might be able to integrate it into the, the lessons ahead. Father, we love thee and we thank thee and we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jason. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. Um, let me make sure that we're recording, have the chat open. All right, air handling, week eight. Okay, so air handling is not to be confused with debugging. The procedure for handling errors in debugging is different than error handling. Does anybody know what debugging is? What's debugging? And you asked what debugging is, right? Yeah, what is debugging? Okay, debugging is a, uh, it's a process, not necessarily a fun one. I, I, I kind of enjoy debugging sometimes where you go through, run your code, figure out where the errors are, and then get rid of them. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I just taught a JavaScript class that ended like a minute before this one started. It went a little late. Uh, and I had this open from that class. Uh, in this application, uh, a user types in a number, they run the function, and it spits out a massive string with the number zero to their number that they typed in. Okay, they were learning about loops in this class. Now, debugging is the process of putting in a breakpoint and I click on run function. And you guys might not know HTML and JavaScript, that's fine. But when I click this button, it will call a build string function. Okay, it'll come in here, call build string. And then this code in this function will get executed. As soon as I push this button, let's do like 5,000. Uh, my code will freeze on this breakpoint. Okay, this will allow me to kind of inspect my code and the values of the different variables in my application and see exactly what it's doing. And so if I look here, I can see that there's a bunch of stuff in document. I can highlight over this whole thing and see that the number 5,000 was input by the user. As soon as we pass that through the parse float function, now we have a nice 5,000 number, okay, called user integer. And I can, I, can, I can use these buttons over here to just kind of step through it. And I can see, okay, uh, is I less than or equal to user integer? Yes, it is, it's true. And I can just kind of step through my code. Really cool. And then I can let it go. And then you can see my function finished up. Okay, so that's what debugging is. Now, error handling in general is not debugging. Debugging is fantastic and it has its place and it's really awesome. You can debug Python. Uh, if you look in Visual Studio Code, uh, let's close up this stuff and let's look in here. Oops, run programs. Uh, let's look at something from like week seven. So here's my names.py. Notice over here, if I just like hover over on the left hand side, you can see that it shows a couple of like red circles. Whoops. And I can actually put a breakpoint there. I, I just clicked right there and it put a breakpoint in. And I can debug this. If I, if I click over here, um, I can click on, let's see, Python current file. This isn't a really good example. Let me go to a different file. Let's go to something from like the beginning of the semester that'll be nice and simple to look at. So our week one prove, and I'm gonna put a breakpoint right here. And I'm gonna go over to debug and debug my current file. Hit yes, and I'll open this up. Well, that didn't look good. Let's see what happened. Oh, it did stop. Okay, so notice this looks, this looks a little bit different than it did in my browser, but notice right here that I'm actually 
like in my application, like it's in the process of running. It hasn't finished yet, uh, but it is running. And it shows my different variables over here. It shows that I imported the math module. Um, and if I, over here, I can see all these buttons, very similar to what I saw in Google Chrome a second ago. Uh, let's see here, step over is F10. So what F10 will do is it'll, it will allow me to just go to the next step in the code. So I'm gonna press F10 on my keyboard. Um, I think it stopped it because of my input. Oh, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna put in 50, let's see if it works. Okay, good, it worked. Okay, I can come over here, I can hover over W, I can see what it is. I can see that W is now declared over here. All right, I'll hit F10 again. And it says, enter the aspect ratio of the tire. I'll say 60, hit enter. You can see now A is declared as well. Um, I'll hit F10, go to my next step, enter the diameter of the tire, I'll say 20. And then each one of these chunks, I can actually see what they are. So I can highlight over this and it will render real quick, whatever I just highlighted. So there's pi, uh, I can look at this. I can see there's pi times W. Um, I can see what will happen inside of these parentheses, you know, and it's amazing. It's really cool because I can just step through and it makes it really easy to find errors in my code. Um, and then it'll just, I hit F5 to just let it go. I said, I didn't, I didn't want to just go to the next step. I said, I'll, I'll let it go and finish the program. And I was able to just kind of step through my code incrementally. So that is a debugger and pretty sure you guys are all using VS code at this point. And this is built in to VS code. Now this right here, uh, Python current file, I named this um, because I have a bunch of different things that I like to debug. But if I click on settings, it'll open up what's called my launch.json file. Now this file is stored inside of like my, my VS code configuration. So if you have a folder opened up on your computer uh, in VS code, which I do, my folder is called git on my C drive. And then I have all these different folders in here. Uh, there's a launch.json file in here inside of a VS code directory. And this launch.json file um, has a version, whoops, has a version and has configurations. And among these configurations, if I took all this stuff out, is this guy right here, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead, um, let me take this out too, and that too, and I'll just copy this, and I'll go ahead and put it on our, on our Slack workspace. Um, because this will allow you to debug any Python file that you have open. As long as it's open and this is saved in your launch.json file, you can come over here and hit play or run or start debugging and it'll just run it and you can put in breakpoints and it's fantastic. So let me put this over here for you guys. This will be for your launch.json file. Okay, I'm gonna put all mine back, but yours will look as simple as it did just a second ago until you start adding other projects and things that you wanna debug. Okay, so uh, any questions on how to debug in VS Code? It's pretty simple, but it takes a while to get used to. Uh, the more you do it, the easier it'll get. So that's how to debug. Now, error handling in general isn't to be confused with debugging. All right, debugging, as you just saw, we, we literally like pause a, a piece of code while it's running. And we can see exactly what the computer is doing with it, which is really nice. Error handling, however, uh, is the process of uh, implementing into your code a way to handle errors so that the program runs. Because if there's an error in my code, and I see it with the debugger, that's awesome. I should fix it. Um, but if a user is using my, my program, they're not gonna debug it. They're not gonna have VS code. They're probably gonna have a, a Python executable that they're gonna be able to run. They're not gonna have any way to debug it. So error handling is me writing code in my program to say, oh, the user didn't enter a number. Uh, let's make them enter a number or something along those lines. Um, so debugging the process of resolving issues in a program that result from internal problems such as syntax, runtime, or logic errors. So uh, my loop that I showed you guys a second ago in JavaScript, uh, where we loop from zero to the number that the user put in, uh, let's say I forgot to have I inside of that loop increment, and I had an infinite loop, that would cause a logic error. It wouldn't be a syntax error, my, my code would compile just fine or run in the browser just fine, but it would definitely be a logic error because nobody wants an infinite loop. Um, but I could use a breakpoint in there to see, oh, I never goes up to one. I always stays at zero. That is a logic error. A runtime error 
uh, is something that isn't able to compile. If I if I try to use a module that does that doesn't exist, or anything that 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 prevents my my computer from actually compiling my program, and then a syntax error, um, if I if I forget uh, a comma or an assignment or an assignment operator or um, or even a logical operator inside of an if statement for a boolean expression, uh, that would be considered a syntax error. Okay, these are all different errors that sometimes can be really hard to find. And the debugger really helps with those. Error handling, however, uh, is the process of resolving errors external to a program, such as a file that does not exist, a connection error from trying to connect to a server or data that can be found uh, or cannot be found on the server and calculation, calculations that, can't, that produce undefined results. So this could be considered from user input. If the user put in something that we didn't like, uh, we would want to incorporate some type of error handling to say, hey, that doesn't work. The worst is when you have an application and it doesn't work and there's no way that you can get it to work. Okay, if I'm a user and I'm on a website and there's a login button, okay, and I go and I put in my credentials and it says invalid credentials that didn't work, but there's no link to like reset my password. There's no link to say uh, anything. There's no, there's no error handling, okay? We want to write robust programs that have error handling in them so that our users have pleasant experiences when using our products. So errors in exceptional situations sometimes occur while a program is running that are out of a programmer's control. A well-written program handles errors in a graceful manner, which may include adjusting to an error, printing an error message for the user to see, and or saving an error, saving an error to a log file. During this lesson, you will learn to write code that handles errors that may occur while your Python program is running. So that both includes today and your lesson for this week your code that you'll write this week. An exception is a relatively rare exceptional event that sometimes occurs while a Python program is running. Uh, I would extend this a little bit to say while any program is running. Java has exceptions. Um, JavaScript has exceptions, C Sharp, PHP. You can raise exceptions in any one of these. And exceptional sounds all nice, like, wow, that's exceptional. Uh, but really what exceptional mean, means is something kind of out of the ordinary. Okay, so when we talk about exceptions in Python or any programming language, we're not talking about, wow, that's an exceptional piece of programming. No, we're talking about error handling. We're talking about uh, something was about to break and we made an exception to handle that so that it didn't break. In Python, an error is a type of exception. There are many different built-in exceptions that may occur while a Python program is running. Uh, when an exceptional event occurs, a Python function raises an exception which may be handled by code at another location in the executing Python program. Python keyword to raise an exception is raise. That's nice. Uh, so let's look at an example. Temperature. We have an input for the user. We say enter the temperature of hot chocolate. We convert that to an integer. If the temperature is greater than 110, we can use the keyword raise and the keyword exception. This will raise an exception. Uh, if the, if the temperature is, whoops, is less than 60, we'll raise, an, uh, we'll raise an exception as well. And if neither one of those get raised, if we hit our else statement on line nine, then we'll just print that the hot chocolate is good to drink. Now, looking at this, you might be like, well, what's the point of using an, ex an exception? I could just have a message that says, you know, the hot chocolate's too hot or too cold. When looking at this, these exceptions in this example will do the exact same thing. It will just uh, allow your program to stop in such a way that you know it. It'll just it will, it will raise that exception so that that condition was was not met and the hot chocolate wasn't drink cold. Now with this example, it'd be really easy to have a statement that says print the hot chocolate's too cold or is too hot. But if I had more code in here, if I had more examples, if I wanted an exception to run, um, maybe I have a function that's called put the hot chocolate in the microwave for five more minutes or something. I could have these exceptions raised and handle that in a very, in a very elegant way, you could say. Uh, so right here, here's what it looks like if an exception is raised. Uh, enter the temperature of hot chocolate, the user typed in 20. Then it said, hey, we had a raised exception on line eight. Okay, and this exception in particular is just a general exception. Uh, you can make your own exceptions that are, they can do anything you want them to do. 
It can display any message that you want, um, but they allow you to customize your programs in such a way that it is really nice to work with them. Because right here, um, yeah, temperature of hot chocolate. I drank some cold hot chocolate the other day. I went and helped a guy chop, chop some wood out in a forest. By the time we came back with our chainsaws from cutting all this wood, my hot chocolate was freezing. I'm like, hey, this is like chocolate milk. And it was fine. Um, but other times, you know, you can't, you, you can't have numbers outside of a, a specific boundary. Let's say I'm computing the volume of a, of a cylinder and the user types in like negative one for a radius. That, 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 that it doesn't work. You can't do it, you know? So you, depending on your program, you'll want to write exceptions to be able to handle your code. And what's really nice about them is looking right here at how this is printed to the page. It's like, yes, this looks like an error. When you're running a job, when you're, when you're running a Python program and it has an error in it, it looks just like this, right? And a second ago, we learned that Python has all sorts of exceptions built in. You know, if you tried to divide by zero, same thing. It'll stop with an error like this that you didn't even write. Okay. It will have an exception. Be like, hey, you tried to divide by zero. That doesn't work. Okay. Well, you can write your own exceptions that say, hey, the user tried to enter a negative value for computing the volume of a cylinder. That doesn't work. And so by doing this, you can see exactly what line of code is being hit when this, when this, when this program breaks, and you can raise proper exceptions to say how you want to handle that. If you want to leave it like this, if you're the only using the, if you're the only one using the program, and maybe this is enough, then great. If you're going to be using this elsewhere, maybe your exception that Ray that's raised uh, takes the user back to a certain point in the program to allow them to kind of fix it and allow them to re-enter a piece of data. Uh, there are multiple ways of handling an exception. The Python keywords to handle exceptions are try, accept, else, and finally. Uh, the try statement is used to test a chunk of code that you know could potentially cause problems. One example that we talked about earlier was loading up a file. If a user types in a file name, um, what is your program going to do if your program can't find that file? So maybe you put that inside of a try block and then you can handle it really easily um, before anything even happens. Uh, within your try statement, you, you want to make sure that if there is a problem, you have the necessary code to compensate for the exception raised. So uh, let's go back to the file example. If they type in a file name that doesn't exist or that our Python program can't find, um, then maybe you have them try again, or maybe you go to some other place in your application or your program, but you don't just let it die. But by putting it in that try block, you can make your program more robust so that even if things don't go right, your program can still work just fine. Except the accept statement is used hand in hand with the try statement. In fact, if you try to put an accept statement in some code without a try, it'll break your code. That would be a syntax error because every accept statement follows a try statement. There's no way around it. The accept statement includes the code to be executed depending upon the exception raised. Okay, again, it's fully customizable. You can make it do anything you want it to. The syntax for using an accept statement is as follows, accept colon with the accompanying code procedure beneath. So we could have it look like this. We have a try statement and we would run some code, test it out. And if it works, great, we, we skip over the accept, kind of like an if else statement. Um, if it breaks though, then we'll go into the accept statement and maybe we say, go back and try again. Maybe we say, okay, don't do this again. Uh, maybe we just print up a message that says, hey, you can't enter negative one for computing the volume of a cylinder. But we'll have that accept block to handle it based on the needs of our application. Uh, accept variations. The accept statement can be used to catch a specific error and it can be used to catch an, an error in general. An accept statement can also be used to catch multiple types of errors. It's important to organize accept statements from most specific to least specific. Now, any thoughts on why we might want to organize these by most specific to least specific? Let's think about, oh, go ahead, Preston. So if we go back to your cylinder example, yeah. um, the really specific one could be the user entered a negative number and the less specific one could be the user entered something that doesn't make sense. If you put the, the user enters something that doesn't make sense first, then that's all they're ever gonna see and they're not gonna know what doesn't make sense because you put in a negative number. 
Yeah, yeah. And there, there's definitely like a, a layering type system that we would want to build. You know, if, if I want to check for negative numbers, if I want to check for numbers over a billion, I might be like, that's a really big cylinder. Do you really want to do that? Um, if I want to check for a, a, a letter, you know, be like, hey, you didn't put in a number. I, I can't do any math with this. You know, so by, by organizing this from most specific to least specific, it will allow us to isolate all of our problems and it'll allow us to have a program that performs well. Because otherwise, you might actually end up, you know, if I said, um, you, you might end up raising multiple exceptions that don't have to be raised. You know, if I said, uh, this is invalid data and this is a negative one. Okay, and you can't do it. You know, instead I could just say, uh, here's a negative one or here's invalid data. But by organizing them from most specific to least specific, it'll allow you to handle that and make it for a very, make your program be very specific and, and convenient for to be used. Um, zero division error. So this is one of the exceptions that's built into Python. Okay, it's already made, it'll do it for you uh, without you having to write any code. Um, but it's code that the computer executes if the code in the try block caused a zero division error to be raised. It's checking for one specific error. Uh, this one right here, checking for multiples. So code that the computer executes if the code in the try block raised a runtime error, a type error, or a name error. Okay, so notice that this one, um, the second one's great. If I have a general need that needs to be met, if I wanted to tell the user that's invalid data, then I could say, you know, I could raise the same exception for a runtime error, a type error, or a name error. But if I wanted to tell the user, yeah, we don't accept numbers over a billion, or we don't accept numbers less than zero, then I might want a very specific exception based on those. But you can make them very general and encapsulate all sorts of different conditions, or you can make them very specific. Uh, we, has our, we have our else. We talked about our try and our accept. Else, if the try block doesn't raise any exceptions, and none of the accept blocks are executed, the else statement is used to run the necessary procedures for zero exception, exceptions raised. This is what we call our happy path, okay? We don't want any of our exceptions to get raised. This is our happy path, our else statement running. Uh, the else statement is identical to the way an else statement is used at the end of an if statement, which is nice. Uh, using the else statement is optional. And then we have our finally. The finally block is code that's executed regardless of what happens inside the try and accept blocks. So no matter what, whether we raised exceptions or not, whatever code we put in our finally is going to get executed. The code in the finally block usually contains cleanup code that frees resources that the code in the try block used. For example, if the code in the try block opens a file, the code in the finally block could close that file. In which case, whether we raised an exception or not, we're going to want to close that file no matter what. So putting it all together, uh, earlier we saw our try and accept blocks of code. Um, else, uh, you could kind of think of our accept statement right here as an if and then our else. So we can say, hey, try this code. If there's an error, we'll run this. Else, run this. And then we'll always run this guy right here, or finally. Okay, questions on this, you guys? I have a question, Brother Birch. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, like from the assignment, uh, we like the checkpoint assignment or whatever i was wondering like how are you how do you know which accept statements to use yeah. um to like get because because like I, I was trying to figure out so I, I i couldn't do it so i looked at the like solution code it gave us yeah. and all the accept statements i was like i wouldn't have thought to put that there so yeah any any thoughts on that any answers that has anyone thought of that so it's really interesting because before you start thinking about exceptions, you don't really know that they exist that much. You know that when there's an error in your code and you try to run it, it'll give you an error and your code just doesn't work and you have to figure out why. But you didn't really think of it as like an exception until this week, right? So it's interesting because as you start working with exceptions, you start learning about what exceptions there are and also how to raise your own created, your own like customized exceptions. You can make your own exceptions uh, just like there are like default ones like zero division exception and 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 some other ones that we just saw. And so Landon, I'm not sure if you're gonna like the answer to this question, uh, but a lot of it is just kind of practice. 
you know, because you could Google like a list of Python exceptions that are built in. And you'd be like, wow, that's a lot of exceptions that are there. And that makes sense because you have an entire programming language that has to be robust. You know, if it's going to open up a file and it doesn't close it or something, it could it could cause issues with your computer. I've seen other programs that run where you go and like press a button and it like shuts off the entire computer. It's like, that's a huge bug. And you got to figure out like what, what code is being run that's like messing with your operating system. And so Python as a language that is very capable of modifying information on your, on your, on your computer, it has to have all sorts of exceptions to be able to run in a robust way. The same way that our programs, when we, when we write them, they have to run in a robust way if we want users to ever use them. And so um, the reason why I'm like, you might not like this answer is because you just kind of have to practice. You know, yes, you can Google a list and you can see all the exceptions that exist. Um, but also every time you're writing an application, you kind of have to think about it. Be like, what exceptions could I put in here? Um, and a second ago, I'm like, that's the happy path is when we hit that else statement, like that's if no errors happen. That is me making an assumption. You know, I assume that when I ask someone for the volume of a cylinder, they're going to give me a positive value for the radius and a positive value for the height of that cylinder. I assume that. I don't assume them putting in a dollar sign and a negative 50, but it's possible. It's very possible, especially if I have a quality assurance engineer on my team working on my code. It's probable, you know? So with that said, anytime I'm making an assumption, I have to kind of be like, okay, I assume that the user's going to enter positive numbers for this. Now, how do I make it so that my application won't break if they do anything else? And so to answer your question, anytime you're writing an application, I just kind of just think about it and be like, what assumptions am I making here? I'm assuming that the user will type in something. I'm assuming that it'll be a positive value. And then write exceptions and, and try blocks based on that. And Googling it, you like, you'll get used to it. You'll find that there are some exceptions that you use a lot more than others. And you'll find that there are some that you make that you'll end up wanting to use a lot. And, and the more you use them, the more comfortable you'll get using them. That yeah, help? Thank you. Yeah, okay. it helps. Okay. Uh, any other questions, you guys? Okay. Well, let's keep going. All right. So check this out. Um, this is one block of valid code, um, except it's all comments. Okay. But we can look at this. So we have a try block. Uh, write normal code here. This block must include code that falls into two groups. Code that may cause an exception to be raised code that depends on the results from the code in the first group. So uh, what are some things that may cause an exception to be raised? Well, I think we've mentioned at least four today. What are some things that could cause an exception to be raised? Go ahead, Preston. Oh, I think you're on mute. That's better. <laughs> uh, dividing by zero. Yeah, great. Great, what else you guys? Nothing? Okay, let's go back. Not initializing a variable. Yeah. Yeah, good one. Uh, let's see, where was that? Okay, we have a runtime error. Pretty sure everyone's seen that. A type error, zero division error, Preston just said. Name error. Okay, and we could even Google, you know, what other exceptions are there? Uh, we also talked about if you can't load a file, if a user tries to put in a file name, and it fails to load, okay? There are so, so many exceptions to handle these things. Here are a few more, okay? Uh, we have, except we have a zero division error. Code that the computer executes if the code in the try block caused a zero division error to be raised. So this would be really good if I was going to compute the volume of a cylinder, maybe I'd have this here. I'd say, hey, if the user typed in a zero, this is gonna get thrown. You know, we're gonna have to divide by zero and. And so we could have a zero division error to be raised here. An OS error, code that the computer executes if the code in the try block caused an OS error to be raised. Value error, runtime type error, name error. Uh, and then we have another accept block. This one right here, we wouldn't necessarily have to have, uh, but this is like a default accept, like a catch all. If there are some, some, if there's some exception that was raised that we didn't already specify, then we can put that here. So looking at this, notice how it goes from very specific to less specific to not specific at all. 
we go from a zero division error, OS, value, all these different errors. And then right here, we'll catch this one for these three types of errors. And then this one down here, we'll catch anything else if there is another exception raised that we didn't account for. Uh, else, code, uh, else code that the computer executes after the code in the try block if the code in the try block did not raise any exceptions. So ideally, we would just skip all this. We try something, yes, the user typed in good values, and else we'll go ahead and run that. And then finally, code that is executed after all the other code is, is, has been executed. Okay. Questions on this basic on this basic structure? Yeah, go ahead, Preston. What is, can you help explain the function of the accept inside the accept? Yeah, so right here, if I wanted to uh, further specify what I wanted to do with a, with a given exception, I could put that here. Now, if I was gonna rewrite this code I, and have an accept inside of there, like I could do it, but I probably wouldn't personally. Um, I would probably just separate the, the name error from the runtime and type error if I wanted it to be separate, but you can have nested exceptions. And so even if in here, if I had code that say like reprompted the user or, um, you know, checked something else in the file system, I could have that also run a separate accept if needed. And so you can have these things be nested. Uh, with this specific example, I, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> Uh, if I wanted a different exception on the name error, I'd probably just say uh, accept value error, accept name error, accept runtime or type error, but that, that's just me. So, but depending on the application, you know, maybe there would be a variable declared or, or a piece of data needed in there that would make this make sense. It's very possible. Okay, uh, other questions on this, you guys? Sweet. Well, let's, uh, okay, so between now and next week, uh, finish the week eight proof assignment, um, and then the week eight team activity, estimate safety improvements, complete the preparation material for week nine and complete the week nine checkpoint assignment. Okay, well, that was all I had for you guys today. Um, I can go ahead and hang around for a few minutes if anyone has questions, um, but yeah, any, any last words before I let y'all go?